There is precisely one flight between South Africa and Southeast Asia, and today we're going to take a deep dive into it in business class. Hi there, my name is Kevin. This channel came from a love of traveling, a love of the full process and the journey itself. I feature airline trip reports and high-end hotel reviews from all over the world. My reviews aren't sponsored by airlines or hotels, so you can be sure to get my unbiased opinion. Am I an expert? You can decide. Am I fair? Yeah, I am. Let's get into it. Welcome to Cape Town International Airport, located to the southeast of the city center. South African routes are one of the Chris Flyer Redemption sweet spots, so if you'd like to know how much I paid for this flight, please check out the description below. Cape Town's airport, at least according to my expectations which were probably wrong, is a surprisingly small operation with flights to just 38 destinations. The flights connecting Cape Town and Johannesburg account for over 40% of the monthly departures at the time of writing. I would also note, more so than any other airport I visited in let's say the second half of 2022, Cape Town's recovery seems to be lagging a bit, which is why today's route is all the more important. This first segment is a tag-on flight, meaning that we're going to be traveling to Singapore via Johannesburg, on the same plane. You can start your journey in either of the two cities. Given the fact that the plane is not even meant to fill up here, check-in was quick and even for economy, the queues were reasonable. As you already know, this flight was not paid for by Singapore Airlines, and they had no knowledge of me being on board. You'd imagine content like this has to be funded somehow, and that's where your subscriptions, likes, and comments all come into play, as they genuinely do help the channel grow, which means more honest content for you. A genuine thank you in advance for stopping by and watching today. Once through passport control, we made our way to the Bidvest Premier Lounge, which hosts a litany of banks, airlines, and the like. Compared to what I would normally expect from an unbranded contract lounge, I was very pleasantly surprised at the facilities, which were comfortable, offered a few views of the apron, and had a truly interesting mix of food and drink on offer. And let's be honest, any lounge that has six kinds of Gouda on offer is a good place to be in my book. I rushed downstairs to catch a few shots of our beautiful bird making an especially graceful landing inbound from Johannesburg. As I mentioned in the opening, this route serves as a vital thoroughfare between Southeast Asia and South Africa, which Singapore Airlines has been flying since 1992 when they began service to Johannesburg, adding the Cape Town tag on a few years after. Originally served by 747s, the route now sees A350s exclusively, the South African service being the second ever long-haul A350 route for the airline. I've been on an airline history kick lately and realized, despite reviewing SQ more than any other airline, I haven't mentioned anything about their history really, so we're gonna just dabble a little bit today. With 54 in service and 4 more on order, SQ is the largest operator of the A350-900 in the world. Additionally, they are the only operator of the Ultra Long Haul variant which they have 7 of. With their total of 147 passenger aircraft, they currently serve 78 destinations in 32 countries, much of which was maintained throughout COVID, despite the company posting their first ever loss in their 48-year history in 2020. Singapore Airlines as we know them today was established in 1972. Ten months after beginning operations, the then Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, bluntly told the airline staff, quote, I set up Singapore Airlines to make profits. If you don't make a profit, I'm going to close down the airline, unquote. Which kind of set the tone for the airline's beginnings. Before SQ even existed, Malayan Airways was formed in 1947, which became Malaysian Airways in 1963, following the merger of the Federation of Malaya with Singapore, North Borneo, and Sarawak. After Singapore's independence in 1965, the airline was rebranded as Malaysia Singapore Airlines, jointly owned by both governments. After five years of operating together though, their different aspirations led to the airline's split. 
Malaysia wanted to focus on a domestic market, and since Singapore literally didn't have a domestic market, they set their sights on international connectivity. In 1972, Flight SQ-108 departed for Kuala Lumpur and began a new era of what would become one of the world's most respected airlines. There's an uncommon sight these days. Boarding began a few minutes behind schedule, but was orderly with priority given to business class and PPS members. PPS is Singapore Airlines' elite club-like system. Let's take a quick look at today's flight stats. These are the stats essentially for the takeoff from Cape Town and the arrival in Singapore as noted. We pushed back three minutes ahead of schedule and for the majority of our journey, cruised at 39,000 feet for a total of just under 12 hours in the air. Arriving in Singapore the next morning, 12 minutes behind schedule. When SQ started out, they are said to have consciously not included local food on board because it was geared towards international travelers. The decor, the aircraft, and the food was meant to mirror the best international standards, but with a decidedly Asian touch. One of those touches being the flight attendants themselves, who were branded as Singapore girls in the early days of the airline, and to this day wear their iconic batik sarong kabayas, and are themselves iconic as well. The beautiful uniforms were originally designed by French designer Pierre Balmain in 1968 for Malaysia Singapore Airlines, and changes were made for SQ in 1974 following their founding. There are currently four versions of the kebaya, in four colors which identify the position of the flight attendant. Male flight attendants wear ties in coordinating colors. For each female flight attendant, the kebayas are custom tailored for each and every one of them. I stepped on board and was greeted by a crowd of crew. I made my way to my tried and true 19 Alpha. I recently named this as my favorite seat of 2022. Let's look at the details and I'll explain why. SQ has three very different versions of the A350s. The ultra long haul ones that I mentioned earlier, a regional version, and today's version, which is the standard one, which feature 42 business class seats spread over two cabins in a one to one configuration. While the seats are very roomy when it comes to width, even I need to admit, the bulkhead seats are key to enjoying the seat as it gives you a much larger sleeping surface, compared to the standard seats, which force you to contort your body when you're in the lie flat position. The seats themselves alternate between plumish mauve and cream color and are a whopping 27.5 inches wide. While there are a few storage areas around the seat, the only enclosed area is a small space next to your seat where you'll find your headphones. To my knowledge, SQ is the only airline which uses a fully custom seat across all of its long-haul aircraft. Certainly, there are other custom seats out there, such as Q-Suites, but Qatar has at least four other standard seat types that I can think of off the top of my head. Tactile buttons are neatly lined up for a variety of seat functions, and there are audio jacks in two spots to serve you well if you're reclined. Lighting on board is certainly ample, with four reading lights of varying brightness levels, in addition to the overhead lighting. There are, unfortunately, no air vents though, but SQ cabins are normally kept pretty comfortable, if not a bit chilly. Row 19 is a bassinet row which might not be for everyone as it does raise the TV an inch or two, but when there are no bassinets booked on board, these seats are opened up prior to check-in for any passengers to select in most circumstances. I'm Chris Flyer Gold, which gives me different access to the seats, but even before I had status with SQ, I was never not able to secure a bulkhead seat one way or the other. Waiting at the seats upon boarding were slippers and socks, both of decent quality but far too small. On my recent EVA flight, I was given a pair of open toe slippers, and they fit. I think it was a first time for me. I don't know why more airlines just don't do that. There was a Penhaligon's amenity kit at each seat, this time in Navy. On this flight, for some reason, I had three corrupt video files, so the shot you're seeing now is from a kit that I had on a previous flight. The content is the same, though. There were some pretty hefty menus handed out, and one of my all-time favorite safety videos began to roll.
We pushed back and would begin to make our way to the departure runway, taking off to the south. The spool up and take off are coming up right now. We pulled a UE and began our straight shot up to Johannesburg, which amounted to 92 minutes in the air. Obviously, these seats don't have doors on them, but between the slight staggering of seats and the small shell around the seat back, they do feel pretty private. For this first little hop, the service was limited to a paprika chicken sandwich or a veggie slaw sandwich. The menu indicated potato wedges and grilled vegetables on the side, but I preferred the Greek salad which made a surprise appearance. The filling of the sandwich was very tasty, but that bread is, I do believe, the exact same bread that I had on my SQ flight from Milan to Barcelona and was just a refrigerated, chewy mess. They do so well in so many regards, but I've never felt bread was one of their strong suits. The entertainment system on board is comprehensive and can be accessed via your remote. The movies on offered are displayed below. Generally speaking, all you need to tell me is how many new releases there are, and I can guess how good the system's gonna be. With 106 new releases, it's a pretty impressive selection. The bathrooms on board are always spotless throughout the flight and came equipped with the standard long-haul amenities, including dental kits, shaving kits, and a selection of Penhaligon's products. There was also a thoughtful fold-down seat. Before we knew it, it was already time to land in Johannesburg's OR Tambo International Airport. Since we are going to be taking off again just very soon, I won't drag out the normal landing montage. We pulled into the gate and I was pleasantly surprised that we were allowed to stay on board for the 71 minutes of ground time and next thing you know, we're pushing back again. This time around, welcome drinks were offered. Orange juice, water and champagne were on offer but I find that SQ won't deny if you have a request for another reasonable, non-alcoholic drink that you might like. And what do you know, here we are again. Spool up and take off number two, a short one, I promise, coming up now. Locking in at 10 hours and 19 minutes in the air, this flight certainly had a bit more ground to cover over some pretty lonely waters. Prior to takeoff, drink orders were taken and promptly served after takeoff. I went with a $16 Riesling and sparkling water. Soon after, my beloved satay cart began rolling down the aisles. Here's the rest of the full menu for the flight. Note the red price tags on the wines are my additions and show an approximate US retail price per bottle. What they're lacking perhaps in wine value, they more than make up for though with the lengthy assortment of coffees, TWG teas, house teas, and cocktails on offer. The satay is served prior to tables being set to hold you over while the main meal service is being prepared. Following that was a marinated prawn appetizer with mango and red pepper salsa. This was good, but I honestly can't remember if I've ever had an appetizer on SQ that wasn't shrimp. A little variety wouldn't hurt. 
some more of that great bread. At least the garlic bread was flavorful. And then the shining star of the meal service. This incredible Indian style braised spice chicken served with biryani rice, cucumber raita, and cashews. This was absolutely phenomenal and easily the best non-Western dish that I've ever had on an airline. It also more than made up for the fact that they don't offer book the cook service on flights originating in South Africa. That was followed up with a deceptively light raspberry cheesecake wrapping up an overall fantastic meal service. This flight is essentially an early and long red eye, and soon after the meal service concluded, the cabin lights were dimmed and the crew asked everyone to put their shades down. Let's take a look at the bedding. I think Singapore offers overall one of the better bedding sets out there with a very cozy duvet style blanket and two full size high quality pillows. There's also a fresh mattress pad already on the sleeping surface. I know that some complain that you need to flip the seat forward to go lie flat. This is as reclined as you're going to get in the normal seat mode. Once you fold it down though, you have a thoroughly enjoyable nook which is just as great for sitting up and watching a movie as it is for getting some much needed sleep. As I've mentioned before, this seat along with Apex Suites are generally the only two business class seats that I can consistently get some sleep on. A few hours later and just up from a nap, I checked out the hot snacks and noodles on offer and ordered a quote, poached prawn, chicken and egg noodles in chicken soup with garnishes. While I do love the bowl itself and the noodles had a nice bite to them, I promise you I'm not hiding prawns or garnishes anywhere. This was just very underwhelming and the chicken was about as dry and salty as my sense of humor. Quick note for those of you that are bothered by light. This is the galley directly in front and the lights are on throughout the entire flight. Around 90 minutes before landing, breakfast service began and they redeemed the soup's poor showing. We began with some exceptionally juicy fruit, along with bircher muesli and a peach yogurt. That was followed by some pastries and a surprisingly good chicken noodle dish. After that soup, I was dubious about ordering this, but it was kind of impressive and even had a smidge of wok hay. Soon after breakfast service wrapped up, the crew prepared the cabin and we approached Singapore, with some beautiful views of the city before dawn broke. And in classic Singapore style, the windows fog up near instantly after you land. Now I'm going to make my way to the Silvercrest lounge for a few hours before my onward flight to Saigon. Let's get into the flip-flop score. Overall, it was a wonderful flight with warm and poised service and a fantastic seat. The food service had its ups and downs, but overall, at least the main components were really good. I'll see you next time on a 787-10 to Saigon.